Last month, ProPublica and On the Media released We Don't Talk About Leonard, a new podcast that explores the web of money, influence, and power behind the conservative takeover of America's courts, and the man at the center of it all, Leonard Leo. Today, we're going to discuss Leo's path to power, how he wields his influence, and his ambitions beyond the court. We'll also answer your questions, which you can send us by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And now, allow me to introduce today's speakers. Joining us is Andrea Bernstein, Kate Shaw, and Julia Longoria. Andrea Bernstein is the Peabody and DuPont Columbia award-winning co-host of We Don't Talk About Leonard. She had previously co-hosted the ProPublica and WNYC podcast, Trump Inc., as well as Pineapple Street Studios, Will Be Wild. She currently covers Trump legal matters for NPR and is the author of the New York Times bestseller, American Oligarchs, The Kushners, The Trumps, and The Marriage of Money and Power. Kate Shaw is a professor of law at Cardozo Law School, a contributing opinion writer with the New York Times and co-host of Strict Scrutiny, a podcast about the Supreme Court and the legal culture that surrounds it. Julia Longoria is currently a freelance radio journalist. Most recently, she was the host and managing editor of More Perfect, WNYC's show about the Supreme Court. She was also, also the co-creator and host of the Atlantic Magazine's flagship show, The Experiment. She began in public radio newsrooms in New York and her hometown, Miami, and her work has appeared on NPR and the New York Times. Thank you all for being here. I'll let Julia take it from here. Hello, everyone. I am so thrilled to be here with all of you watching and with these two brilliant people beside me in the little Zoom boxes. Um, I met Andrea when I was a baby reporter at WNYC, um, so I was a little starstruck when she asked me to be the Master of Ceremonies here. And Kate Shaw, the team at More Perfect, are huge followers of your work, so I, I'm so thrilled to have you here. Um, we are here today to talk about a very powerful man that people do not talk about, as the ProPublica podcast title uh, says. Um, and with me today are two reporters who have talked about him. They've been paid attention to him for a long time and uncovered the influence he uh, has had on our third branch of government. Um, I, like a lot of us here, I imagine, was very cool in high school. <laughs> and I was on my high school's constitution team. And I think like a lot of Americans, I was taught to really venerate the courts. Uh, the Supreme Court was supposed to be the protector of our liberties above the fray of politics. And maybe it's that mythology that has made the institution vulnerable to uh, behind the scenes influence. Um, so let's dive in. Um, Andrea, I wanna start with you. Can you take me back to the very first time you heard the name Leonard Leo? Oh boy, interesting question. I feel like probably I heard about Leo in conjunction with the Supreme Court and his work or the list that he gave to then candidate Donald Trump, uh, which I really don't think we learned about that list until the end of the campaign and when Trump became president, that here was somebody who worked for the Federalist Society who was giving Trump a list of justices. And it sort of crossed my radar as well. That's a lot of power for one man. And however, um, when I learned about it, I was working on the podcast Trump Inc. and very much focused on Trump's business uh, and the relationships and conflict between the Trump business and the Trump presidency. After the Trump presidency, I uh, worked on another podcast called Will Be Wild, which was about the insurrection. And then this Leo podcast, in some ways, I mean, it's much broader than, than Trump, but we went back and sort of looked at Leo's relationship with Trump and how he got to be the person who uh, gave Trump these lists of Supreme Court justices. And one of the people, one of the scholars that we spoke to when we were reporting the story was Amanda Hollis Brusky, who wrote a book about the Federalist Society and teaches it um, uh, at uh, Pomona College. And she said to us something that really sort of stuck in my mind very early on in our Leo reporting. And she said, giving Leonard Leo control over who would be his Supreme Court nominees was the only promise that Trump ever kept. And I thought to myself, wow, that is true. So that was the beginning. Uh, and then everything sort of spooled out from there. 
And Kate, my understanding is you, you've been watching Leo longer than that. You you had your eye on him. Is that right? When did he first get on your radar? Well, I have, and I, yet I don't recall the first time I heard of Leonard Leo. I, I, I've been trying to think of it. Um, I actually took constitutional law many, many years ago with Steve Calabresi, one of the founders of the Federal Society, uh, with whom I've remained very close over the years. Um, and he founded the Yale chapter. He's usually credited as one of the founders. Um, so I don't think I heard, you know, talk of Leo back in my law school days, but but I I kind of think I'm going to tell a brief story if you'll indulge me, which is that when I was so I clerked for Justice Stevens in the 07 to 08 term, and 2007 was the 25th anniversary of the Federalist Society. They threw a big gala at Union Station, which you know kind of gets transformed into this like gorgeous event space, um, and the Supreme Court is just up the road from Union Station, and um, at some point, all of the law clerks clerking that year got an email inviting us to the 25th anniversary gala. And my co-clerks and I said, we should go. And so we sent an email to the Thomas clerk who had, who had forwarded the invitation. And she said, are you serious? And we said, well, was the invitation serious? And she said, sure, if you want to come. So anyway, we came. Um, and it was a fascinating and revelatory evening. Um, you know, 25 years in and this extraordinarily powerful institution that still in many ways clearly conceived of itself as a set of insurgent outsiders, despite the presence of multiple Supreme Court justices, despite a recorded video message from uh, then President George W. Bush. Um, it, it was it was really sort of a star-studded affair. Um, and yet that was the tenor of the event. Um, and I feel like he must have been there. And yet I cannot confirm that fact. Um, but certainly somewhere in my sort of years as a young lawyer, I, I heard the name as someone who is an important player in federal society circles. Um, and certainly so for about almost five years, I've co-hosted the Strict Scrutiny podcast with Leah Lippman and Melissa Murray. Um, and, and for as long as we've had the podcast, we've we've spoken about uh, Leonard, but definitely not as much as uh, Andrea and her colleagues um, who have done just incredible reporting, both in print um, and in the WNYC collaboration. Um, so I've learned a ton uh, from their work, but but certainly I had a little bit of knowledge going in. That's so. I, I would need to fact check this, but I am pretty sure Leonard Leo not only was there, but spoke. He spoke at most of the that's annual right. I think that's galas. probably right, but I, I'm a single source and I, I might <laughs> write it. It's a hazy recollection, but I would love to know if that was true, because then I could actually confirm that's the first time I at least saw him right. in the flesh. Maybe, maybe we can, maybe we can like check it in the, in the course of this hour, but I mean, I think you know, that Julia was one of the things that I think really motivated was, us was that here were, was somebody who um, made such a faint impression, even on people who's, you know, were incredibly interested in what he was doing or would have been had they known. And that was one of the reasons why we wanted to do this podcast and, and the long form article for ProPublica was to really bring it all out. Who is this person who has so immensely influenced all of us? I mean, you know, this, if you take the Supreme Court, you know, we always say, well, he didn't just, and then we have to put just in air quotes, because just helping to confirm or nominate six members of the Supreme Court is quite something for one human being. But then the sort of series that we did is how he's done so much more than that. Yeah, and I, I want to kind of rewind to the beginning of like L Leonard Leo's um, career, because it's kind of striking that someone who's never held office um, has had such an outsized influence on, on politics, on our courts. Um, ProPublica published a, a high school photo of him that really struck me that he, was, he and his wife were um, apparently voted most likely to succeed. Um, and they're like pictured with these huge glasses and piles of money. <laughs> um, and he certainly has been successful um, at reaching his goals. I mean, Kate, can you talk a little bit about how he began? Um, how did he start to get so much power without without holding office? Oop, Kate, you're muted, I think. Sorry about that. I don't know how that happened. Um, I, I want to defer to Andrea on that, who I think has a much better sort of sense of the kind of origin and trajectory. Um, but but I, I, I do think that there are individuals for whom the spotlight holds no appeal. And my sense has always been that um, he very early on had this incredible insight, which is that sometimes you know, whether it's that you can redirect the energy in ways that, you know, allow you to sort of amplify your impact if actually 
you know, sort of self-promotion um, is not consuming any of your attention or time, um, whether it's that or, or, or whether it's a set of sort of, you know, interpersonal skills, which I think are a very kind of unique set. Um, and those I think I have only really learned about from the reporting um, uh, that Andrea and her colleagues have done, um, but that there is you know, that, that there was sort of a fire within him that I think everybody was able to perceive that was a deep commitment to a set of sort of deeply conservative legal principles um, and, and an ability to identify individuals, fellow travelers, and really cultivate relationships and help shape the trajectories of their careers and thus create this network of relationships and loyalty um, that was able to over this is a very long term project of many decades I think it really sort of speaks to kind of long term vision and patience and the way that you you sort of have to admire whatever you think of the kind of substantive visions and values. Um, uh, so those are my impressions, but I really I have to defer to Andrea in terms of actually having more sort of direct insights into into how he was able to do all of it. So I have a story about that. Uh, high school yearbook photo. Um, but before I say that, I think that what Kate is saying is uh, really essential because, you know, unlike, say, the Koch brothers or George Soros, like, I mean, I used to um, cover, I covered the 2016 presidential campaign and Bernie Sanders would always have a line about the Koch brothers and like the whole crowd would say boo. And, you know, Trump similarly talks about George Soros and, you know, people say boo or they, you know, sort of metaphorically say boo on, on social media. But here's Leonard Leo is not a wealthy person. He didn't come from wealth. He, the house that he grew up in was so modest. It's like a one story bungalow on a street in a sort of, you know, basically affluent suburb, but the street was, you know, sort of not fancy. The houses were close together. The houses were small. And that is where he grew up. But he understood very early on that um, understanding how to raise money was a key to success. And I had gone down to, I had been trying to find his high school year, yearbook, just sort of like basic kind of investigative reporter 101. Like, let's try to find out what he was like and tried to track it down through the high school. And I had called the library and I said, well, do you have it? And they said, we don't have that year. And I thought, okay, well, I'll drive down there anyway. Maybe they'll have something from 19, you know, another year that happens to have a picture of him. And then I went there and I said, do you have 1983? And they said, yes. And they brought it out and I start paging through it. And there at the top of the class page is Leonard Leo. And he's wearing a you know, unlike everybody else, I mean, it was the 80s. So it's like, you know, muscle shirts and mustaches and, you know, big hair. And he has, a, you know, a, a blazer and a vest and he looks very serious and he's the president of his class. And then I'm flipping the pages and there is this most likely to succeed picture with the person who was the vice president of the class, now his wife, Sally Leo, then Sally Schroeder. And they are the most voted most likely to succeed with, as you say, this pile of money. And one of the interesting things is, is that, you know, Leo wouldn't do an interview with us because, I mean, well, no, let me rephrase that. He said, yes, I will do an interview, but you can't ask me about my relationships with Supreme Court justices or my financial arrangements. So we declined. But then he did engage with us. He did answer our written questions. And he answered that written question saying that he um, was... Um, in high school, he, he was nicknamed Moneybags Kid because he raised so much money for the senior class events that there was money left over to go back to the high school. And that was the beginning, I think, for Leo of understanding that raising money could be a route to power. And he he got his start, my understanding from, from you know, your reporting is that he got his start at the Federalist Society, um, which is kind of a hard organization to wrap your mind around like you know more perfect did some reporting at one of the federalist society meetings and some members told producer Alyssa Eads um we're just a debate club <laughs> um so can you talk a little bit about his early involvement in the federalist society and kind of how that that started the whole project well I would love to hear from Kate a little bit about this debate club thing because I do think it's like a I mean, I think at one point it was true, um, but Kate, since you studied with Steve Calabresi, who was one of the founders, maybe you have- Which, By the way, he taught us a, a freshman seminar that I went to, so he's gotten around. Oh. 
Um, well, I, I don't know. You, you can probably speak to this as well. So so maybe I'll say just to say something about Steve at the outset. I, I do think that he played it unbelievably straight in his con so as a con law professor. He did, I think, absolutely no sort of inculcation of conservative user values in the classroom. And I mean, to his great credit, I, I don't know about your experience if it was an undergrad. Um, uh, but it um, but so so I do think that you know, even founders of the Federal Society, I think the sort of classroom component should be divided out from what the mission of the organization more broadly was, um, was and is. Um, but, you know, folks like Amanda Hollis Brusky are, I think, the real experts on this. Steve Tell, they, they both, both Amanda and Steve Tellis have wonderful books. Um, uh, the Rise of the Conservative Legal Movement is Tellis's book and Ideas with Consequences is, is uh, Hollis Brusky's book. Um, I think both wonderful. Um, you know, there are, it's, it's a longer story than we could sort of tell here. I think you have a few different factions of both sort of anti-government, anti-regulatory lawyers. You have actual social conservatives. You have sort of a few different strains that fuse together um, with different sources of funding for different aspects of the project. But I think maybe broadly speaking, I think it's fair to describe the Federal Society and its inception in the early 1980s the account given by a lot of members is that it's a reaction to the sort of liberalism of the Warren Court in the 1950s and 1960s, and a good degree, the kind of early Burger Court and its sex equality jurisprudence, and of course, you know, contraception and abortion in the late 1960s and into the 1970s. Um, and that this kind of sense that the sort of institutions of law um, were captured by liberals, and that conservatives needed to mount some sort of response to that, um, and that Supreme Court was a liberal institution, and the Constitution was being interpreted for the first time, in my view, in ways consistent with the equality promises of the 14th Amendment, and in, you know, robust readings of the criminal procedure protections in, um, you know, the Bill of Rights, and, uh, you know, a correct sort of broad reading of, of the First Amendment, um, but one that was sensitive to dynamics of sort of power uh, and money. Um, and so, you know, there are, I think, new, for sure, to my mind, correct, but new interpretations of many constitutional provisions. And I think for many conservatives in the law, and that included really prominent folks in um, the Reagan administration, in particular, the Justice Department under Ed Meese, um, and that included, you know, later Supreme Court justices like John Roberts and Sam Alito, um, and, you know, Thomas, although he wasn't in the Justice Department, he's in the Reagan administration and EEOC. Um, that was the sort of the kind of like um, initial like animating force that they were responding to. And I think that story gets told in both of the, the books I just mentioned. Um, and then I think it's a kind of long and complex story in which you have um, a number of, you have both government actors who are really important players, a lot of individuals inside, you know, academic institutions, and then funding um, that comes from various sources, but um, is small in the beginning and then becomes not at all small. Um, uh, I think, and I, you know, I guess I don't know exactly at what moments in time Leo is the sort of driver of the sort of funding, um, but it becomes an incredibly powerful network that is, again, in its inception, sort of about responding to and correcting what is perceived as this kind of liberal overreach of the sort of institutions of law and the Supreme Court in particular, and, and seeks to sort of offer a blueprint for reorienting in a correct way, uh, a vision of the constitution and, and of our law that, you know, protects uh, corporate interests against regulation um, that does not read into the Constitution rights that are not explicitly written into it, um, that, you know, maybe is what uh, is described as, you know, colorblind that will not permit race conscious measures by government, uh, even those designed to ameliorate histories of subordination and discrimination, um, or to advance values like equity and diversity. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a grab bag of values. I think there's a through line, but it, 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 to, to a lot of them, but I think they come in a couple of different buckets. Um, and so, you know, it becomes this incredibly powerful institution with chapters in law schools and um, cities across the country. Um, and to the debate society piece, and I'll just say maybe one, one word and then I'll stop talking. Um, I think that it has long been the case that um, the Federal Society has described itself that way. And I don't think it's false, it's just wildly incomplete. Um, and I do think that FedSoc chapters um, historically um, put on often genuinely rich and illuminating debates in law schools um, and elsewhere on pressing legal questions. And I think that um, I haven't in years, um, but I once upon a time did occasionally participate in federal society uh, debates. I definitely attended a lot as a law student and to a degree as a, as a young lawyer. Um, and I think that the part of the reason it's successful is that they partly because of funding, you can sort of put on a nice event and, and, and feed and, you know, water people well, but also to attract good people and pay airfare and things like that. Um, you have really kind of high level debate about pressing legal questions. Um, and so I think that's part of the way 
that sort of that's part of the identity that FedSoc sort of puts forward. And I think absent the kind of digging that, again, academics uh, like Amanda and Steve and also investigative reporters like Andrea have done, that might be the only thing that individuals really knew about the federal society, I guess, but for the famous uh, Trump list. Um, and that, I think, is what sort of catapulted into public awareness the existence of this network and its unbelievable power and reach. Yeah. And, and, and uh, I, I want to get into Andrea's uh, reporting around uh, Leo's influence beyond the Federalist Society. Um, so, you know, you uncovered, just to name a few of the things, the, the role he's played in sort of setting up a pipeline for not only Supreme Court justices, but Supreme Court cases, uh, helping to put leaders in state at a at, leaders in place at a state level, sorry, say that four times fast, um, um, who would bring, uh, you know, who would be bringing cases to the court um, and, and um, sort of move along a conservative agenda. Um, so could, could you rewind to the beginning of your reporting, Andrea? Like, what were your questions? How did you go about um, answering them? And, and what were some of the obstacles? Yeah, so when we started this project, and by we, I mean, so, um, uh, Ilya Meritz uh, and I, and Ilya and I have uh, collaborated on a number of podcasts. We joined the ProPublica democracy team just a little bit after Andy Kroll had uh, broken the story of uh, Leonard Leo getting $1.6 billion to control uh, in dark money from this electronics magnate named Barry Side, and it's kind of an obscure person. It was at the time the largest dark money contribution in American history. And we began asking ourselves, well, what does he want to do with $1.6 billion? So that was the origin. And we began to sort of, you know, ask around and sort of look at the different things that had been written and the money trails. And I would say one of the early insights that we have that we could see was this, that Leonard Leo was the vice president of the Federalist Society. Uh, even though there was a president Leonard Leo sort of ran the organization in many ways, raised the money, and not only worked on this sort of conservative legal nonprofit, but cultivated relationships with presidents. So became the outside advisor for George W. Bush. Uh, one Bush advisor described us, you know, as the, like the person on the PTA who comes to every meeting. So because they come to every meeting, they get the power. And this was how Leonard Leo cultivated access. Once he had access to President George W. Bush, he began suggesting Supreme Court nominees. And he had also worked on the nomination of Clarence Thomas. So he was already connected to the U.S. Supreme Court very early on in his career. So one of our earliest insights was that Leo went beyond this nonprofit world. He got access to Supreme Court justices and presidents. And then in Washington, sort of used that currency to raise money that he would plow back into the Federalist Society and also into an immensely influential and little known organization, which was called initially the Judicial Confirmation Network. And this was even before Citizens United, a group that was spending money on first the Supreme Court nominations of uh, Alito and Roberts, but then quite quickly on something that we really didn't understand at all until we began to do this reporting, which was state Supreme Court justice races. And Leo got way down into the weeds. I mean, take one example. In Missouri, uh, Leo and the Federalist Society, but Leo in particular, wanted to change the way justices were selected, going back to the thing that Kate was talking about, they were felt like the, the nonpartisan plan that Missouri had was favoring centrist and left-wing justices. So they wanted to get rid of that system and replace it with uh, elections uh, and or a way to have more direct political control. So they went right into Missouri and there was a, the strategy was that there was a new justice that was supposed to be selected and Leo started threatening the governor, basically saying through his chief of staff that if you select this person that we don't like, the fury of the conservative movement will come down on you uh, like you've never seen before. And that's a paraphrase, but it's pretty close to the actual uh, wording that Leo had. And 
you know, one of the interesting things is, is I made calls and sent emails to people in Missouri for months. I spoke to the person who was the chief justice at the time this was happening. And I said, well, what about Leonard Leo or the Federalist Society? Were they involved? Mm, maybe a little bit. I'm not sure. And then I came across these emails. And that was sort of the pattern that repeated. But one of the things that Leo understood early on was that so much power lay in state courts because they could not only, I mean, they, you know, it's not only worse, I think 90 plus percent of the litigation is decided in the country, but they could send decisions up to the US Supreme Court. And that became the machine that Leo was working on, was to not only get the justices, but to get the outcomes by working on state Supreme Court justices, working on supporting specific candidates for uh, attorney general who can get cases off into the Supreme Court more quickly, supporting conservative law firms. So there was a whole machine to produce outcomes like, say, the Dobbs decision of 2022, which Leo was very, very concerned with, but a whole bunch of other decisions that, you know, Kate and company have talked about a great deal on strict scrutiny having to do with the administrative state, uh, climate law, voting rights, all of these things uh, have gone up through the machine that Leo has built uh, to influence the way the Supreme Court decides cases. Yeah, and a little bit more because I I just find it um, really remarkable that that you've been able to uncover um, you know these emails and these kinds of relationships given how you know what what lengths. Um, Leo seems to have gone to like keep this out of the you know out of the the public eye like what were some of the obstacles you hit like how did you get people to talk to you and, and yeah <laughs> well one of the things was that I mean one of the reasons why we didn't why we called the podcast we don't talk about Leo is you know we um put out I mean you know Leo is a public person he was executive vice president of the Federalist Society and worked with many people he had worked with law professors uh, he had worked with scholars and you know we did something early on which you do when you're reporting which was we said oh we asked the, we went to those people we said we'd like to talk about Leonard Leo and then we heard from his PR team and they were like well, you know what is it you want to know and we were like well we want to talk to people who think highly of Mr. Leo because you know, we want to understand the full person. And uh, it was very hard. And there were people who told us who were Leo associates, no one will talk to you because of his $1.6 billion and they're afraid of cutting off access or they're afraid that there might be some political re repercussion if they want to run for office. So people were very, very reluctant. I mean, at the end of the day, we were sort of joking because I think we... Um, you know, we settled on the title, but then people did talk to us for the podcast. His high school classmate, one of the co-founders of the Federalist Society, many former state Supreme Court justices spoke to us, uh, some of them, you know, on tape, on, you know, on the record, and his neighbors. Uh, and so, but overall, I mean, I've reported on some people that you know, don't want to be reported on, the Trumps, the Kushners. I've run into a lot of obstacles, but I would say this was one of the tightest, you know, hardest circles to penetrate. And also the thing that, you know, Kate was talking about earlier, the way he sort of glanced across, you know, the radar without making an impression. So it became, you know, that was one of the hard things of really sort of like, he was somebody who as Kate was talking about, sort of embraced being in the background, which is very unusual for Washington. And that meant that it was, you know, hard to, you know, pull in those moments where he really made an impression. Julie, can I jump in with a, a quick question, which is that I, I don't, I promise I'm not trying to take the moderator mic, well, but I, <laughs> I love it. More as a collaboration. <laughs> okay, okay, thanks. I'll ask um, you back, so. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, great, right. It'll just, chaos is going to ensue. No, but this is a question that I wanted to ask you, Andrew, when we had you on strict scrutiny, but we ran out of time and so I didn't get to. But I was curious if you were surprised at his willingness to participate at all. So you said he was willing to, 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 to actually sit for an interview, although proposed parameters that you guys were not comfortable with, but then did answer written questions, um, like really did. And I actually found that somewhat surprising. So I was curious if you expected a response at all. Um, and it, either way, kind of to what do you attribute his willingness to participate in some form with your reporting? 
So we honestly didn't know. I mean, he had sat for interviews before. He sat for an interview with the Washington Post, uh, for example. There were a spate of interviews uh, sort of mid-Trump administration after Gorsuch, maybe after Kavanaugh, where he, you know, did sit down and talk to people about his, you know, role in, um, you know, pushing for these conservative justices who are now in the court, maybe also after Barrett, although there was, you know, so little time between that and the election that I couldn't say for sure. Uh, but so he is somebody who's spoken publicly, and we just didn't know uh, if he would want to talk to us after, you know, the whole thing happened with the interview and we were like, you know, you can decline to answer, but we can't put a parameter on what we're going to ask. Um, I wasn't sure, but then, you know, very, very deeply, we, you know, we sent out a, maybe 20 pages of sort of factual questions to fact check, as well as just a number of reporting questions. And he, you know, engaged in a number of them and he confirmed many things. I mean, you know, for example, just to take one, the Judicial Crisis Network, Leo is not a part of in any formal way. So investigative journalists over the years have like jumped through hoops to describe his relationships. They were on the same hallway. They were, you know, founded at a dinner that he hosted with Justice Scalia and he invited, uh, you know, Robin Arkley, who is a sort of mortgage magnate, if you will, uh, you know, and others to this dinner who would give money. But we said to Leo, you founded and supported the Judicial Crisis Network, and he confirmed it. And that was like, okay, so all of these sort of, you know, hopes and things that we, you know, had prepared to do, we don't have to say because Leo has confirmed it. And, you know, some of that, I mean, one of the things and maybe we're going to sort of talk to this now, but but one of the things that he has made him so powerful is that he goes to these federal society meetings at law school and he meets people and he mentors them and he calls them and he makes calls on their behalf and he places them in jobs. And, you know, one of the people who had worked with him told me that, you know, once people got to, once he nominated them for judge or justice, they were people he'd known for 20 years. So we gave him a list of people um, that, you know, we had been, you know, we understood that he had mentored. One of them was Lawrence Van Dyke. Um, you know, there was a number of other people. One of them was Eileen Cannon. And he, you know, confirmed that he had Eileen Cannon. It was the Trump, the Florida, the Mar-a-Lago documents case judge. Uh, and he confirmed that he had mentored these people. So we didn't know. So I don't know how the sort of answer to were we surprised by something that we didn't know, but we didn't know what to expect. But, you know, I feel like it, it certainly made the portrait more complete. And I think it speaks to the fact that, you know, Leo, um, you know, he's an image man. He runs a company called CRC Advisors, which advises people on public relations strategy and, you know, obviously cares about his own image and how it is shaped. You know, so much of what you're talking about, the way he's sort of um, been successful at having influence has been building these networks of people. He knows them from the beginning of their careers um, and fundraising. So nothing we've talked about is is illegal. <laughs> um, you know, at More for Perfect, we kind of joke that like everyone in the legal profession seems to be on the same group chat. <laughs> like everyone kind of knows each other. Um, and I wonder, like, you know, a, a, a list, an audience member actually asked, like, should Leonard Leo's rise be seen as a scandal or is it just a blueprint for success? Um, do either of you want to answer that that audience question? I, I love, I'm interested in Kate, what you think about that? <laughs> yeah, I think, um, you know, when when Justice Scalia passed away, Jamal Green, a professor at Columbia, who's a wonderful scholar, had a an op-ed in the Times, and I can't remember that the headline said something like, he was my hero. Not that I believed in anything he thought about the Constitution, but he was unbelievably effective and successful in convincing, you know, now a majority of the court and the lower courts and the public writ large of the correctness of this method of constitutional interpretation, originalism and textualism. These are sort of the methods with which he's closely associated, although I think both have um you know, evolved in ways that I'm not sure Justice Scalia could even have uh, predicted or anticipated or even maybe would have wanted. Um, and, 
you have to give it to him that he was an unbelievably effective spokesperson for these methods. Um, and there have not been justices on the left who have been effective communicators about their methods of interpretation in the same way. Now, there are all kinds of reasons for that, and this is a little bit of field. So, so I'll come back to Leo, but but I think there's a related point to be made, which is that um that I think that that it's I would say there's a combination. I think that there is um the the um the left has not had figures like Leonard Leo, um, and I'm not saying that they should, but I think that that is that it's a descriptive kind of observation. Um, but I think that to the kind of questions where you said nothing that he is engaging in is, is is illegal, and I think that's from what we know that seems right. Like there are certainly norms being violated, um, and I think that m one of the sort of big important lessons of you know the last sort of six eight years of our national life is. Um, uh how much of our sort of collective public lives, and uh, that includes sort of both worlds of both law and politics, are, have been governed by, uh, even in the law, more norms than hard law, or at least a lot governed by norms in addition to hard law. Um, and so I think things like um, lobbying and advocacy of elected officials in terms of the uh, appointments that they will make to the state bench or the federal bench, bench um, are longstanding practices and that administrations of both parties uh, and groups, uh, both left and right, have long engaged in, um, but that there have also long been kind of boundaries and lines respected and observed. Um, so even in, situ in, in, in sort of settings in states where the, you know, voters have decided and state constitutions have decided to select judges in a way that is different than the federal system and to, you know, create judges where, you know, you run for office, um, you're not insulated the way federal judges are, at least sort of structurally and formally uh, from, you know, direct political accountability and feedback, um, like they serve for life, things like that. States mostly make different choices. So so even where some politics and law have been commingled and things like judicial selection, there have just been boundaries observed uh, and maintained in terms of the, the, the kinds of lobbying, the kinds of sort of self-conscious efforts, say, to get judges with particular ideological profiles uh, considered. Um, and you might say, well, a lot of that is just you know, sort of etiquette or sort of circumvention. And in some ways, like what this did was uh, the, the kind of efforts to sort of directly appeal to elected officials um, to sort of seek to have more conservative judges uh, placed on the state bench and and also to seek, um, Andrew didn't mention, but um, one of the, I think, sort of many wonderful things about the reporting is what it sort of, the light that it sheds on the once obscure office of the state solicitor general, this really, yes. really important <laughs> office inside states, inside state attorney general's offices um, that, um, you know, I think as, 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 as uh, I'll, 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 you know, garble this a little bit, but I think as Andrea said, something like once upon a time, these were these, you know, offices that defended the state and did some, you know, fi financial protection of consumers, things like that. And now we're doing unbelievably high impact national stakes kinds of uh, litigation that involve everything from sort of, you know, climate change to student debt. Um, every major presidential policy um, seems to be subject to a very swift challenge, typically by the state of Texas and often with other red states in tow. Um, and that is a pretty new development and closely linked to the rise of the Office of State Solicitor General. Um, and so there too, you know, deliberately targeting AGs and seeking to convince them to appoint sort of young, highly, highly ideological lawyers in order both to allow those lawyers to use the office uh, to promote a legal policy agenda, sorry, but the uh, uh, siren outside, um, but also to kind of burnish the credentials of those young lawyers uh, in order then to help catapult them to these positions of sort of judicial office, the federal appellate bench, things like that. That's not in any way legal, but those were just things that were not done because there were norms against doing them for a very long time. And so um, I think that if you sort of believe in institutions and norms uh, as important institutions, and I do, I think that you don't necessarily want sort of a symmetrical uh, effort on the part of, you know, the legal left to respond. And on the other hand, um, you know, sort of uh, just a, a, a decision to kind of unilaterally um, fail to, to to utilize tools that actually are now on the table and are important also seems really problematic and designed to lead to more kind of like asymmetry and a distortion of both like the kind of personnel on the bench and, and substantive legal outcomes. There's obviously a close connection between those two. So as my long answer probably reflects, I think I'm conflicted. Is it is, is, is mm -hmm. it, There's much to admire. I don't think that I at least can't really deny that. And yet I don't think that it's conduct or a path that um, I would want to see emulated either. I just, um, you know, would, well, just a quick asterisk to that. Leo is being investigated by the D.C. Attorney General um, regarding a complaint about uh, inappropriate 
uh, sort of use of nonprofits. I mean, one of the things we, we haven't touched on, but we we talk about uh, in our more in depth in the article, but also in the podcast series a little bit is about the way that Leo created a network of, of nonprofits. He's on the board of them or he raises money for them uh, and they give to each other. And it becomes very confusing uh, to sort of follow um, the money train, which I think is another reason why it's very hard to talk about Leonard Leo, because, you know, by the time you've explained the money that goes from, you know, JCN to Students for Life to et cetera, to et cetera, to et cetera, you've, you know, used up all your time, especially if you're working in the audio format, <laughs> as we do. So, um, so, and then many of these nonprofits hire the company that Leonard Leo runs. So there's a question there, but um, I don't think that that's really what people are talking about when they say illegal. I mean, I think what Leo figured out, as Kate was just saying, is like, you know, we have called him like the Robert Moses of illegal infrastructure because he's figured out these uh, mechanisms and places to exert power that nobody else thought of. Um, and for example, one was the, you know, all of episode two, much of it is about uh, Lawrence Van Dyke, who's now a, just a judge on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in a very powerful position, very, very conservative, uh, particularly when it comes to the Second Amendment. Uh, he is somebody that Leo nurtured from early on. He was in the Federalist Society at Harvard. Um, you know, we were told by various people who were familiar that uh, Leo uh, and his associates had called around making sure he had a job. He worked as um, in the Solicitor General's office or as Solicitor General for three uh, different states and is now in the Ninth Circuit. And uh, there's even a bit, bit of a more of a surprise that I'll let people listen to episode two to hear what that is. But, you know, his sort of career prospects are even brighter than that. And this is the exact way that Leo sort of figured it out. And it takes a long, you have to focus for a long time. You have to focus for 20, 25 years if you're starting with law school and you know, you're know you looking all the way up to the highest levels of the federal judiciary as Leonard Leo is doing. And you know, we've talked about the ways that Leonard Leo has um, sort of elevated the Solicitor General uh, position, the ways he's kind of um, influenced who's in power at the state level. Um, but you know, over the past year, um, our understanding of Supreme Court justices and the norms around the Supreme Court uh, uh, around the Supreme Court have shifted thanks to some dogged reporting from ProPublica. So we found out that there are gifts that some Supreme Court justices are accepting from uh, billionaire mega donors. Um, and that's, again, something that's not quite illegal, but <laughs> seems to violate a norm. Um, Andrea, how does Leonard Leo fit into the picture of, of, of that arrangement? So he is actually in the picture uh, in one of these um, uh, trips when he um, and Clarence Thomas and Harlan Crow, who is a Texas real estate magnate that uh, ProPublica uh, reported on a lot. Um, Harlan Crow invited uh, Clarence Thomas up to his um, mansion on Upper St. Regis Lake in the Adirondack Mountains. And there was a picture painted and Leo is in the picture with Harlan Crow and Clarence Thomas uh, and a couple of other legal associates. In, on another trip, with um, the Justice Alito took, where there were, um, Paul Singer was there, who uh, is a hedge fund magnate, uh, and ultimately had a case that was, uh, had an interest in a case that was decided by the Supreme Court. Uh, it was a seven to two decision, but uh, Alito had voted in his favor. And they all go up to an Alaska fishing trip, and our colleagues, uh, Justin, Justin Elliott and Josh Kaplan and Alex Majerski discovered that the only link between these people, between Paul Singer and Robin Arkley and Alito is Leonard Leo. Leonard Leo is in the middle of it all. Leonard Leo is setting these things up. He is arranging these trips. Uh, he even in fact arranged for Paul Singer to get his salmon that he had got from his fishing trip after it wasn't delivered to him. And that I think is something that was central to our understanding that Leo, um, 
would befriend these very wealthy people who might have an economic interest in Supreme Court decisions. And they would donate money to Leo's causes that would then reinforce the sort of uh, moral conservative, the anti-abortion conservatives, the ones that um, you know were pushing for decisions uh, on religious liberty or on same-sex marriage. And but the money machine, you know, sort of was boosted by these encounters, so far as you know we can tell from our reporting. And you know, as these revelations have come out, um, there's been sort of a, I think, like an awakening from the public, like, wait a second, shouldn't this be against the rules? And like, wait, there's no rules. And there's sort of been this call for an ethics code. Um, there is an ethics code for lower court justices, but um, the Supreme Court didn't have one until this week uh, when they finally publish one. And, and Kate, I wanted to get your take on, on the ethics code. Have, have you read it? Do you have any initial impressions, reactions? <laughs> I, I hate it. I read it. I, hate it. <laughs> I think it's, um, but I think it's so important and just enormous, enormous credit to the folks at ProPublica and also the Times and elsewhere who have done the reporting, the dogged reporting that is 100% responsible for the fact that the justices felt enough heat that they put together this woefully insufficient document. But the fact of it, I think, is enormously important. Um, I, I, it's been characterized as worse than nothing, and I think there is something to that in that the document, in a very kind of defensive um, sort of preamble statement, um, suggests that it is merely codifying the practices the justices have already followed, the rules the justices already adhere to. And I think that in Milheiser at Fox had a great, um, I thought, distillation of this aspect of the problem with the document. Um, but that is that it can be read essentially to retroactively bless everything that we have seen reported on that Andrew was just talking about, because it says the justices already do this, but here to, in order to, says the document, dispel a misunderstanding that the justices are not in fact bound by any ethical rules or guidelines, we've basically put it in writing for you. Um, so that I think is enormously problematic just as sort of a framing device. Um, and I also think the substance of it is wildly deficient. Um, so there are even things like affirmative permission provisions for justices to engage in fundraising activities, um, which I think was at least murky previously. Um, and here a justice may assist nonprofit law-related civic, charitable, education, religious, or social organizations in planning fundraising activities. Sorry, I'm reading here and maybe listed as an officer, director, or trustee, et cetera, et cetera. So there are actually a few places where I think that um, there is an affirmative blessing given by the court um, to activities that at the very least the justices many of them believe themselves unable to participate in that of course they don't have to simply because the ethics code says it's not prohibited um uh but there are other places where um it seems as though the justices actually are not prohibited from using the prestige of the court or the office um just prohibited from knowingly using the prestige of the court uh, or their offices um that seems like an important distinction right they can simply you know, claim ignorance if in fact they are engaging in activities and others responsible for organizing those activities are trading on the justices' positions, the physical building of the court, uh, things like that. So, um, so I think I think it is an incredibly underwhelming document. Um, so much so that I'm actually a little bit surprised that everyone joined them. I mean, they guess they they they, they like to hang together in, in in something like this and they sort of put forth a unified front to the public. Um, but I can't imagine all nine of them think that this document goes far enough or does enough. Um, and yet, I think the fact that they felt the need to do it, that they felt the heat, uh, is a testament to how important this reporting is and how important it is that it continues. Now, is it going to result in a better document that actually clearly prohibits some of these activities, in particular the ones involving accepting gifts? Um, I don't know. Um, but I think that it is it is a testament to it actually really mattering. I mean, I feel like, I mean, I've, you know, read a lot of critiques of it. And Julia, I'm really curious to know what you think. I feel like, um, I feel like a couple of things. One is that, you know, when, when ProPublica started doing our reporting and there were discussions, you know, are there laws broken and, you know, are there 
rules broken, which is important part of obviously of journalism. But you know, when the story came out about Clarence Thomas taking five hundred thousand dollar vacations, like scrambling for a rules violation is not necessary. I think people understand that that is problematic. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why this reporting cut through is because it's just clear. And, you know, as somebody, I mean, I have spent probably, you know, more time of my life, you know, more hours of my life than anyone should covering like corruption cases and having something written down uh, is not always a solution. So for me, the fact that there is a document is, an, you know, it's encouraging because it suggests that maybe the court you know, is responsive in some ways to what's going on in the real world. And also uh, there's a framework to begin a conversation. So I think I'm less, um, you know, unhappy about it than, you know, people that, you know, I mean, I'm not a lawyer. So I think people who are lawyers sort of see the deficiencies of which I will not disagree. There are many, um, but also I feel like, wow, there's a document. That's great. You know, that's a, that's a starting point. But Julia, I know that I, you know, you're the host. <laughs> But I am curious what you think, because you've also spent so much time thinking about this court. You know, what do you think about that document? Yeah, I think I think I do feel I feel similarly in that it's nice to at least get some kind of response. I think in the initial days after the reports came out, the silence and the lack of response at all, it seemed like was pretty discouraging. Um, so it's nice to get a response. But yeah, I mean, I. <laughs> I feel similarly to Kate in that, you know, even from the, you know, they could have just adopted what the federal judges have, right, as far as their ethics code. But like the the little detail that I found really amusing is like the federal judge uh, ethics code says like justices shall not. And this code says justices should not, <laughs> which is already softer. <laughs> it feels like that seems like a small, like semantic thing that you could have just <laughs> copy pasted. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, it is. It is. Um, I hope it's the beginning of a conversation, um, like you say, Andrea. Um, we are running out of time, so I, I want to get a couple of audience questions in. Um, a lot of audience members have been asking about uh, Leonard Leo's Catholic background and how that kind of plays into his goals and his sort of outlook um, in his political project. Um, do one of you want to take that? Kate, you want to take that? Sure. I, I don't know. I can't really pretend to speak to it. Um, I presume that his, you know, sort of pro-life views seem to have been forged from a very young age and i am sure that catholicism played a role in that um and uh and, and i think that 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 you know maybe there are other you know i guess i don't know where he is on things like the death penalty uh, honestly um uh and you know sort of uh so i i presume that that see, that that is an important through line and i think it was a site of you know sort of bonding and and solidarity with you know, like Justice Scalia and other Catholics on the court. Um, but that's probably uh, the, the only, I, I'm sure it has played a central role, but I don't really have any anything else to say about it. Yeah, I mean, I think I would just, I mean, I would refer people especially to the ProPublica article about Leonard Leo, because we do dive into this in depth and we ask him about it and he addresses it. Um, it is a fundamental part of who he is. And he, um, you know, he gave a speech that we quote at the very beginning of the podcast to the Catholic Information Center in Washington, in Washington D.C., which is sort of a you know meeting ground for powerful Catholics. Uh, he gave a speech uh, in just about a year ago where he really you know spoke of feeling aggrieved, um, which was extraordinary to me because he'd won Dobbs, he had six people on the U.S. Supreme Court, he had 1.6 billion dollars to spend, um, but he spoke in the language of we are losing, and it was a very sort of religious interpretation. Uh, so I will refer people to that. I mean, I do think it, um, you know, and he, you know, he's a devout Catholic. He goes to mass, you know, maybe every day of the week um, and, um, you know, talks about how his faith really fundamentally influenced where he went and um, all of the justices that he supported are now Catholics, uh, and there are there what seven, right? Seven of the nine. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> 
and um, I think we have time for one more question. So I'll um, I'll throw it to the both of you. Um, a reader wrote in asking what Leo's end game is. Um, what do you think his end game is? I want to give Andrew the last word on this, and I do think that's a, a good segue to the sort of Teneo kind of Federalist Society for everything. If that's something the audience would be interested in hearing about, I think it's endlessly fascinating. Um, I will talk about Teneo and the other things he's working on, but I'm wondering, Kate, do you have an answer to that? What is that? <laughs> I, I, I don't. Clearly, I think the fact that there is this sort of um, sentiment of aggrievedness that is still on display makes quite clear to me that he does not believe his work to be done. And so there is certainly another end game and control of the U.S. Supreme Court, which is quite an accomplishment is not enough. And so there, there is certainly more and maybe more inside the law, but, um, but definitely expanding the reach outside of the law is on the agenda. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, Teneo is a group, uh, the Teneo network is a group that Leo recently took over that we have characterized as a federal society for everything. I mean, Leo in a promotional video says that, you know, I've been successful in the conservative legal movement and I want to bring that to all of culture. So Hollywood, media, education, uh, you know, really sort of infusing it with his uh, with his values. There's some very concrete things that organizations that he has supported are working on. Um, one of them is called the Honest Elections Project, which has backed many efforts to, for example, limit mail-in balloting, limit the franchise in other ways. Um, and, you know, I think also we are watching closely to see how he maneuvers uh, the 2024 election. Um, it is obviously, I mean, in the Trump administration, he not only recommended justices, he recommended general counsels, he recommended DOJ personnel, he recommended cabinet secretaries, and we are watching for signs of how that will go in a potential second Trump administration. How would he try to influence staffing? Should that come about? And how are they preparing? And uh, I think that is, uh, you know, something that must be very much on his mind is sort of how does he keep it going? I mean, one of the things about these court structures is you have to keep it going. And we are, we, you know, we are watching that closely. So I don't know if that's an end game, but it's, you know, continuing to, uh, you know, expand the influence that he's had uh, in the ways that he has. And, and uh, I hope that people will, we have more of that in the podcast. So I hope that people will listen to all three episodes, which you can find if you just put, we don't talk about Leonard in your podcast search engine, you will find it. Great. Well, that's a perfect place uh, for us to end. Um, I want to thank uh, all of our speakers, Andrea, Kate, and Julia, for this illuminating conversation. Um, and to all of you listeners, thanks so much for tuning in. We hope to catch you next time. Thanks again. Have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.